Well, good morning. We're going to dismiss our children up through sixth grade down to children's ministry. God bless you as you go. And I want to remind all of you, we've been announcing this for a number of weeks, that next Sunday morning um, in this service, as well as possibly in the 11 o'clock service, we'll be having a water baptism. So if you're interested in that, uh, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you've not been baptized, why? That's the big question. It's really clear. Uh, the Great Commission, our great mandate is to go and to make disciples, to baptize them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, and to teach them. So it's an important step. It's a step of following after the Lord. So contact the church office. We'd love to talk with you and make that happen this next week. You probably noticed I don't have my glasses on. Uh, some people have noticed that. So I shared that with our uh, musicians and uh, you know, said, pray for me that I can see my notes. And some said, well, pray that you can't see your notes one way or the other. So I don't know how you want to pray, but you can pray that God's word would certainly uh, have its impact today. So we're in the book of Isaiah, and last week we were in Isaiah chapter 6, and we saw this amazing vision of God that really rocked the world of Isaiah, the holy God seated on the throne, and at the same time we had that view of what was happening on the earth. And so we were challenged last week to consider our view of God. Are we worshiping a God this morning that we've created, or the God of the Bible? Are we worshiping kind of a caricature where where we highlight those aspects of God that we really like and we minimize and sometimes even ignore the aspects of God that we think might be a little bit troublesome. That was in Isaiah chapter 6, so today we're going to focus in on Isaiah chapter 11 and 12, and you might ask, well, what happened in all those other chapters? Go ahead and ask that. Thanks for asking. All right, so we're going to talk about that a little bit, just for a little bit, all right? All um, right. Now, when we began our study in Isaiah, we pointed out we're not doing this verse by verse or necessarily chapter by chapter, but picking up some themes that are repeated through Isaiah. So, in Isaiah's chapter, or Isaiah chapter 11, uh, 7 through 11, we see some thoughts that are repeated that we emphasized in chapter 6. Namely, that, that God is working on earth and he is seated in heaven, and there's this contrast through the book going back and forth. So in Isaiah chapter 7 through 11, you see about the king Ahaz and about treaties and conspiracy and all that sort of thing. And yet God at the same time is reigning supreme and using all of those circumstances and even bringing about those circumstances to accomplish his purposes. God is preparing the Assyrian empire to be his disciplining hand on his people but at the same time we read in those chapters that he's going to bring his judgment on Assyria God is using all of those things to accomplish his purposes in the midst of those chapters as well we see these beautiful hints of the Messiah that's coming so there's some well-known verses that we emphasize particular times of year. In Isaiah chapter 7, we read, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name what? Emmanuel. It was in one of our songs this morning. So we have this hint that one is coming, the Messiah is coming. And then in chapter 9 of Isaiah, we have these words, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, the Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. So again, a very beautiful glimpse of one that is yet coming. Long after Isaiah, one is coming. So as we capture the theme of this, this study, to learn to live right, to learn life well, we need to see Christ always and what he's doing, what he's going to do, what he continues to do, and that is the repeated message in Isaiah. So we have this dichotomy, this contrast throughout Isaiah, 
What is now and yet what is coming? The kings on the earth now and the king that is reigning supreme. The kingdoms on the earth now and yet the kingdom of God that is present and is going to be fully revealed. The mess now and the mystery and the beauty of what God is doing. We have the present and we have the future and God is in control of it all. Amen? So as I've been studying Isaiah, I almost feel like I'm, I'm watching a tennis match where you're looking here or what's happening. Then, boy, then we fast forward over here and then we go back. And it's just like that all the way through and it's almost a little bit dizzying and you kind of lose track. So as we consider a verse in Isaiah chapter 12, and this is going to kind of what guides us today, Isaiah chapter 12 starts with this, Then you will say on that day, so the obvious question one must ask when you read that verse is what? What day is that? Is it this day? Is it this day? Or is it a day yet future? So if we're going to make sense of that, we have to look at the context because I think it can be answered actually rather easily as you look at the context, which is always important. I want to remind you as well, and this is just a good place to do it, when we have our chapter breaks in Scripture, those are not divinely inspired. Those are actually put into the biblical text in the 1200s. All right? And for a good reason, so that I can tell you in Isaiah chapter 12, verse 1, it says this, instead of saying, there's a place in Isaiah where it says this. Or when I have you turn someplace in your Bible, it's really very helpful, but sometimes the breaks are a little bit awkward. So if we're going to understand this statement in Isaiah chapter 12, we have to go back into chapter 11 and go back even to the end of chapter 10. Here's what it says at the end of chapter 10. Behold, the Lord, the God of hosts, will lop off the boughs with a terrible crash. Those also who are tall in stature will be cut down, and those who are lofty will be abased. He will cut down the thickets of the forest with an iron axe, and Lebanon will fall by the mighty one. So those verses refer to what God in, in the present time, in time of Isaiah, was going to do. It's a reference to what he's going to do with Assyria. Although he's going to use Assyria to accomplish his purpose, he is then going to come down on Assyria and and protect his people and continue to use his people even though they were at that point even rebellious. So these verses talk about how God divinely intervenes to bring Assyria down, to bring their assault on Israel to a stop. And then in classic tennis match fashion, we pick up chapter 11, verse 1, where we have the same imagery where it says this, Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. Just understand what the text did. In those between the end of chapter 10 to the beginning of chapter 11, we just spanned a hundred, hundreds of years. All right? And so now Isaiah, using the same imagery of what he's going to do with, what God is going to do with Assyria, is now talking about this shoot that is going to stem and come up from this root of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David. What we have there is a beautiful reference to who? Jesus Christ, the Messiah. So here's what's happening now, but God is in the future going to bring this one to, to, out, out, of, out of the stump that everybody thought was dead and gone, out of the stump that everybody thought well, nothing was going to happen. He's going to bring the Messiah. He looks forward then to that day yet future. God is the God of the past, present, and the future. And so we see it very clear in Isaiah, and it's important that we have um, the view to what he's done in the past, what he's doing now in the present, and what he is going to do in the future. Amen? We need to see all of that because God is in control of all the death. So what is that day then in Isaiah 12, verse 1? It's mentioned again in verse 4. It says, in that day. What day is it? Well, by looking at the context, it's not the day that Isaiah is in. It's not even the day that Jesus 
walked the earth. It's a future day when the Messiah is fully known, when he is manifest in a full measure, in a beautiful way. It's talking about that day. It's talking about the day yet future when Jesus, the Messiah, returns, brings to completion his plans and his purposes specifically for his people Israel. Don't lose sight of that. As we're going through this, it's very easy to try to just apply it to us, but it needs to first be applied to the people of God, the nation of Israel in a very specific way. So here's our task today, all that by way of introduction. As we consider that day, the day that's yet future for us, what does that have to do with this day? What does that have to do with the days of the past? And how does it all fit together? So here's where we're going. We're going to talk about the reality of this day that's yet future, the response to that day, and then the question that I love the most, so what? So what does it really matter? So if you have your Bibles open, I'll also use the screen. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, we read this. Here's what's going to happen on that day. Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord, and he will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Also righteousness will be the belt around his loins and faithfulness the belt about his, about his waist. So one of the big challenges that the early followers of Jesus had is they thought that what the Messiah was going to do when he stepped on the scene in their time some 2,000 years ago, they thought he was going to do this, what we just read. And they kept expecting him to step in and, and bring the rod and bring down the Roman Empire and bring his kingdom to bear fully, and yet it wasn't that day then. Jesus came at his first advent, not like this. He came as a meek and mild Savior. He came as a lamb to be slaughtered. It was not the time for him to bring down any empires. It was the time to begin to see his kingdom come to bear on the planet. He did not come to judge the people them. He came to intercede for them, to advocate for them, to even substitute for them. But on that day, in the day of the future, that all changes. Amen? It's different. Jesus is fully revealed on that day as the judge, the righteous judge who sees and pierces into the hearts of people. The text tells us there, in the last part specifically, he will be a perfect judge, but not an easy judge. He will be a righteous judge, but not a passive judge. Look at it, it says, he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Two phrases, the rod of his mouth, the breath of his lips. That word rod, it simply means a stick or a pole. And on that day that says that this rod will strike and will bring judgment, it's interesting as we look at Psalm 2, we see the same reference, the same imagery. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You will shatter them like earthenware. But what's also interesting in, in Psalm 23, a very famous passage, it's used in a different way. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your what? Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. It's the same rod used in a different way. It's the same Jesus just coming with a different purpose. Some people, it seems, have a difficult time understanding that Jesus in his fullness is both the lamb and the lion. He is both the infant in the cradle and the conquering king. That day that's yet future will straighten out all of that confusion. There will be no questions then. The breath of his lips, it says, will slay the wicked. Think about that, the breath what he speaks will bring down the wicked. 
That was the same breath that said, peace, be still. That was the same breath that says, neither do I condemn you. That was the same breath that said, don't hinder the little children from coming to me. That was the same breath that said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. It was the same breath that on the cross he says it is finished. It's the same breath coming from the same Jesus, but to accomplish his full purpose. On that day, on the day yet future, the fullness of the Messiah will be seen. We also see in Isaiah chapter 11 that, that on that day his kingdom will be more fully revealed. Beautiful passage here starting in verse 6. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb and the leopard will lie down with the young goat and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a little boy will lead them. Also the cow and the bear will graze, their young will lie down together, the lion will eat straw like the ox. The nursing child will play with the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. goes on in verse 9. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Then in that day, then in that day, the nations will resort to the root of Jesse. And who is that? That's Jesus who will stand as a signal for the peoples and his resting place will be glorious. Those verses refer to that time yet future and we usually refer to it as the millennial reign, a thousand years when Jesus in a very literal, specific way reigns on this planet from Jerusalem. There will be peace at every level at that time. And we see references in this passage to those beings that are uh, enemies becoming peaceful, the lion and the lamb. And, and of course, some theologians would say this is not a literal experience, that it's more figurative. But it seems to me that it's very literal, and, and, it, and certainly there are, there are aspects of what we've just read on the screen that are happening now as God works and brings peace even among people. But in a very specific way, he will bring peace peace to this planet that will be beyond anything we've ever experienced. It will be a time when uh, all creation, Romans 8 talks about that all creation even now is groaning and longing for the time that we just read about. When Jesus the Messiah is fully known, creation itself, even the plants are groaning for the full revelation of Jesus Christ to deal with this cancer of sin that has infected everything. One day when Jesus reigns, it will be seen more fully what God has designed even for Adam and Eve, that his kingdom, his peace, and his power becomes more fully known. Notice verse 9, they will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. I love this phrase, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. What a beautiful image. The knowledge of Jesus Christ, the communication of Jesus Christ, covers the whole earth just like water. And that is ultimately what I believe brings that, that huge, that, that peace, that manifestation on the earth that's never been known before. The prophet Zechariah captures this same reality with some different words and the Lord will be the king over all the earth and in that day there it is again the Lord will be the only one and his name the only one on that day Jesus the Messiah will be fully revealed his kingdom will be more fully manifest and then we also see on that day that's yet future his remnant will be fully restored. Continuing on in the text in verse 11, then it will happen on what day? On that day, the Lord will again recover the second time with his hand the remnant of his people who will remain, going down to verse 16. And there will be a highway from Assyria for the remnant of his people who will be left just as there was for Israel in the day that they came up out of the land of Egypt. So we've seen as we've gone through Isaiah that God's chosen people have been hard-headed 
and they resisted God, and they continue to resist God even today. But on that day, the people of God, the Jewish people, there will be a remnant. There will be a remnant that comes back, that sees Jesus as their Messiah, and it's beautiful to see that even happening now. See, God has promised his people that he would always be faithful to them. He made a promise to the Jewish people, starting with Abraham. Let me show it to you. In Hebrews chapter 6, the New Testament refers to it. For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. God swears by himself to Abraham, I will bless you. I will surely multiply you. And one day, that will be more fully known when his people begin to see who he really is. Now, some today have written off God's people because they have rejected the Messiah, by and large, to this day. Some will say that this blessing, this remnant, this, this gathering, and even the continued full blessing now rests on the church. And I would just completely disregard that theology. The church, Scripture says, has been grafted in to the blessing. And so we're part of the blessing, but we're not the people of the blessing. The Jewish people are the people of the blessing. Some would even, in kind of a crazy way, apply these blessings to America. Ouch. That's painful when that happens, all right? We are not the people of God in America. We have been blessed, amen, and we desire the blessing of God. But the blessing, the ultimate blessing of God on any ethnic group is going to be on the Jewish people even into the future. And so we see in these verses the remnant. Not all of them, but the remnant. A portion of them will be rescued and will be received by God because they recognize Jesus as who he is. God is not through with his people. Just as I was getting ready to come here today, I saw on the news, there's a lot of missiles being lobbed back and forth from Israel to Gaza. Um, I'm not concerned about Israel. I'm concerned about Gaza. Because I think as we continue to watch what happens, God's going to show up in some pretty amazing ways, just as he has in all of history past, to protect his people. And we need to continue to pray for the people of God and pray for the peace of Jerusalem. God, be merciful <laughs> to those who come down on Israel. They are his people. And we see again that he's going to, in the future, on that day, make his commitment to them very, very visible. So we have the reality of that day. Not this day, not the day in the past, but a day that's yet future where Jesus will be fully known, his kingdom will be fully manifest, and his people will be restored well what will be the response then second half of the message what will be the response to that day in in chapter 12 now we get to see the response and and it just this really just covers one of the possible responses there's actually two responses to that day scripture actually says when that day comes some will be terribly afraid some will be in anguish some will be terrified because they're not in relationship with this Jesus that's going to be fully known. But here's the response to this day yet future to those that know their Messiah. First, there's humble thanksgiving. It says in verse 1 and again in verse 4, Then you will say on what day? That day. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for although you were angry with me, your anger is turned away and you comfort me. In verse 4, and in that day you will say, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name. Now we don't see it in the English, but in the Hebrew that's a little bit different in that the first thank you is a personal thank you, it's singular. The second thank you is a corporate thank you, which I find just a little bit interesting. There is a response of humble thankfulness by many on that day, and it's important to notice why are they thankful. Look at that. Because God's anger has been turned away. God's anger is no longer against them. Does that mean God is an angry God? 
Now, I don't think I could say God's an angry God, but certainly God expresses his anger. And he, he events, if I can say it that way, his anger. It's interesting, that word anger that you see on the screen up there, it means literally nose or nostril. So make the connection. It's a type of anger that somebody has when their nostrils flare. Your spouse ever do that? No. It's anger. And one day, and, and, and one day in the future, that anger will be absolutely turned away from his people. Why? Because they've looked to the Messiah. They've looked to this one, this anger that God has had with his people, and we even see it in Isaiah. In his time, he brought his anger down on his people. Now, all of us, no doubt, have had people angry with us, haven't we? You ever had anybody angry with you? Yeah. You're, you're nudging that person next to you. I certainly have had my share of people angry with me. I know it's hard to believe, isn't it? Completely unjustified anger, of course, but angry with me. It's interesting. We, we understand what it's like to have people angry with us. But sometimes, because of who it is, we say, yeah, they're angry, they'll get over it. You ever do that? Yeah. yeah they're, they're angry, they'll be fine. Can't do that with God. See, we do that with people when we recognize they're really not that significant to be concerned about, the fact that they're angry with you, and they really can't do anything about it anyway. But it is kind of a bad place to be to have God angry with you, isn't it? It's not a good thing to have God angry with you. It wasn't good for the people of God back here when God was angry with them. And they look forward to, and they will respond with humble thankfulness that now this anger is completely turned away. Understand that God's anger is always just. Any expression of his anger is always appropriate. Yet God is not out of control. Certainly sometimes in the human realm when people get angry, they get absolutely out of control and you never know what they're going to do and they do ridiculous things and you nudge that person next to you again. But God's never like that. His anger, while intense, the expression of it is never out of control. It's always appropriate. So one day, on that day yet future, the people of God will express humble thanksgiving because they recognize that God's anger has been fully meted out in Jesus Christ and it's been turned away. Let me just apply a little bit of that to the church in general just briefly. In, in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, catch this. Christ died for us. Much more than, having now been justified by his blood, we be, shall be saved from the, what? Wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, you see that? Understand, in the right theology says everybody is born an enemy of God because of our sin. We were all once an enemy before God, and even today, if we're not in right relationship with, with God through Jesus, we are still a what? An enemy of God. And, and some would say, well, I don't have anything against God. I kind of like God. Amen. Well, let me just tell you, God has something against you, and it's this issue of sin, regardless of your novel idea of, of how nice God might be, He's angry with you because of the sin. Our personal sin and our choice of sin and even our sin natures. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, well, she, we shall be saved through his life. Isn't that beautiful? Jesus Christ is the one that turns the anger of God away. For his people... For us, as we are grafted into that blessing. Next we see in verses 2 and 3 in Isaiah 12, this joyful recognition of who God is. 
Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. Therefore, you will joyously draw water from the springs of salvation. Now, it's real important here. While we do want to apply that to us, we need to understand the immediate application is to the remnant, the people of God. They will one day recognize the fullness of what God is to them in Jesus Christ. He says, behold, that's a statement of exclamation, behold, God is my salvation. God is our salvation. That will be clearly known on that day. And as you look back through the history of the people of God, they kept having trouble understanding that God would be the one that would take care of them. So what did they do? They made idols that they thought would help them. They made treaties with other nations they thought would help them. And yet on that day in the future, they'll cry out, God, you are our salvation, and we recognize that. Really important note. They don't say that God has provided salvation or God provided a way of salvation, or that God provided a system of salvation, what is said? God is my salvation. Salvation is not in a system or a program or a plan or theology. God is salvation. Him personally. And they will understand that more fully in the future. And then I love the images that Isaiah connects with that recognition. God is my strength and my song. Let's just camp on that for a minute. He, God himself, is their song. And we talked about the power of song. And song isn't just something that we think. Song is something that goes deep. Song is something that touches our emotion. Song is something that makes us clap and raise our hands. Song is deep and intimate. And in that day, God will be seen as he really is, as their song. And the Hebrew people throughout their history have often broken out in song. And that will become even more so in the future on that day when Jesus, their Messiah, is fully known. God will be much more than a factual, theological idea. He will be seen as he truly is, as their song And then notice this other phrase. Therefore you will joyously draw water from the springs of salvation. Don't you just love that image? The springs of salvation. And joyously drawing water. God himself is their salvation. And they will joyously approach him and experience all of his fullness in that day yet future. Rejoicing in that provision what i love about that image of water and we'll see that god uses that often is water necessary everybody says yeah we know that god is absolutely water is absolutely necessary to have life god is absolutely necessary to have life is water enjoyable yeah and that's the image we get here these springs of beautiful water that aren't just only necessary but they're enjoyable made me think when i was in high school a couple of summers in my high school years i went to work on a uh, hay ranch outside of denver a little ways up in the foothills it was hot 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 dusty sweaty work and in this huge field where we were always hauling the hay out there was a well it was your classic well it was the kind of well that you would pump you know those kind And the water that came out of that well, I don't know how deep it was, I don't know anything about it, but all I know is what came out was ice cold, beautiful, pure water. Boy, do you think we look forward to stopping at the well? Every load that came out of that field, we stopped at the well, and we replenished, and we looked forward to that. It wasn't just that we needed it, we enjoyed it. And that's the image we have here. The people of God will recognize that not only did they need the Lord, that they can enjoy the Lord and drink joyously from that well from the springs. The prophet Jeremiah seizes the same image. Here's what the prophet says in Jeremiah 2. For my people 
have committed two evils. We're talking about the same people now. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. That's their one evil. And the second evil, they have hewn for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold hold no water. You see what the people were doing back here in this day? They were rejecting that spring of, that God intended to be for them, and they tr- started, they tried to go to all the other nations and, prov- and have provision for them that could never be accomplished. And they worked hard at that by digging out and carving out these cisterns. When we were in Israel a number of years ago, you see cisterns everywhere because it's a dry land. And so you see these cisterns, and and I don't know what you're thinking in your mind when you think of a cistern, just a small cistern. These are huge caverns that would take months and months and even years to carve out of the rock. And Israel is all rock, so you can dig cisterns just about everywhere. And they did that. And in the rainy season, the water would pour into there and it would fill up. But what if there's a crack in the cistern? Yeah, you'd walk down there in the middle of the summer and there'd be nothing there. And that's the image. It says, my people are working so hard to make things work for them and provide for themselves with all these other gods and all these other peoples and all these other treaties. And when they go to get the help they need, what will be there? Nothing. But he says, I intend to be to them this spring, not a cistern but a spring that is constantly flowing with fresh, satisfying, much-needed water. Of course, Jesus sees that same image, doesn't he? Remember the woman at the well. Here's what he said to her. Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water that I will give him will come up in him as a well of water springing up to eternal life. I think we got one more slide. Can you click on that next one? Nope, that wasn't there. Okay. So we see that this image of water, that Jesus himself and and God in his full manifestation is this beautiful spring. And on that day, God's people will joyfully see their Messiah for what he fully is, their salvation, their song, and that source. Look at this quote. Preacher from long, long ago said this. If a man or a woman, if there is a man or a woman that thinks of salvation as if it were merely a shutting up of some material hell or the dodging round a corner so as to escape some external consequence of transgression, let him or her learn this. The possession of God is salvation. That and nothing else. I love how he says that. Sometimes we think of salvation as just the ticket out of hell. It is that, amen? I'm thankful for that. But God intends to be so much more than that. God himself, for his people in the future, and I would say even for us now, intends to be our song. He intends to be our our, our spring that satisfies us. The next thing we see in this response is this bold proclamation, verses 4 through 6, is this, Make known his deeds among the peoples. Make them remember that his name is exalted. Praise the Lord in song, for he has done excellent things. Let this be made Let this be known throughout the earth. Sing aloud and shout for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. So notice those bold words of proclamation. Make known and praise and cry aloud and shout for joy. On that day there will be bold proclamation of the people of God that will be very natural, be very easy, because they'll recognize Jesus more fully. His deeds will be made known. His name will be exalted. His praise will be shouted. Has anybody seen the hype that's uh, been going along about something in Cleveland and about LeBron James going back to Cleveland? Anybody notice that on the news? Boy, talk about 
bold proclamation. It's like Cleveland cannot believe that LeBron James, the king, is coming back to their city. They're not ashamed about it. They put it on their front, their front, the front pages of their paper. And, and I don't know if you're a LeBron James fan. He can certainly play basketball. But let me tell you, on that day, on the day yet future, it will be about the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And so we get hyped up about all these things, and it's kind of fun. But we need to remember that in the future, there's just going to be this day that pales everything else that is to be looked forward to. So we have that day, a day that's coming, when the reality of Jesus will be for, fully known, his kingdom will be more manifest, his people will be restored, the response will be thankfulness and recognition and proclamation. But now the big question. What's the big question? So what? Everybody ask that. Otherwise I couldn't finish the rest here because thanks for asking that again. That's an important question. So this is maybe all good theology. Maybe we all got all the dots right about what's future and what's past. Maybe that's all good, but you come down to, so what? I have this day. And frankly, this day is a mess. We live with these challenges, with these difficulties, with the, some victories and some huge disappointments. So what does that day have to do with this day? Maybe you've heard that statement that some people are so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. You ever heard that? That could never be the case. It's not possible to be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Scripture actually, we're going to see in a moment, says just the opposite. Now when we've been talking about that day, Specifically, it's not about what we think of as heaven, but it's certainly a time when the spiritual realm becomes much more manifest on this planet. In Scripture, what we see is a constant and consistent connection between that day and this day. And the problem isn't that we think too much about that day so that we can't function in this day. I'm getting a little dizzy going back and forth. But the problem is we don't think enough about that day, therefore we don't function right in this day. That's what Scripture tells us. So this so what question becomes really important. So here it is. Let me give you the biblical foundation for what I just said. 1 Peter chapter 1 says this written to some people who were in deep persecution, Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, and it's reserved where? It's reserved in heaven for you, who are protected right now by the power of God through a faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now get this. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. You see what Peter says? He says, there's a day coming and he didn't recognize that day coming. And that salvation is going to be fully revealed. And rejoice in that even though right now in this day it is really a mess. He tells them that so they can travel through this day looking forward to that day. Romans chapter 8. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Stop. What did he just say? The sufferings of this day aren't worthy to be compared to the amazing things that are going to be revealed to that day. In other words, if we have a view of that day, then these things shrink down to a 
doable size. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God, the passage I referenced before. Even creation in a mess here is looking forward to that day there. 1 Peter chapter 4 again. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Because this day really is not that far away in eternal perspective. That changes our priorities for this day, doesn't it? We're sober, we're serious, we're prayerful because we're looking forward to that day. 1 John chapter 3, Beloved, now, on this day, now we are the children of God and it has not yet appeared as yet what we will be, but we know that when he appears, that's that day or at least part of it, we will be like him because we'll see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him on that day, him coming on that day, does what? Purifies himself in this day. Do you see the very clear connection? That when we anticipate and look forward to the day that Isaiah told the people of God about 2,700 years ago, when we think about it, when we dwell upon it, when we anticipate it, it really does change our perspective of this day and the mess we seem to be living in right now. So it really does matter. That day really does matter. So much of the book of Isaiah was written to the people of God because they needed to be reminded about that day. And they never really saw that day in their time, but it's something that they will certainly even experience yet future. C.S. Lewis, phenomenal writer, You've probably read Mere Christianity. Look what he says here. It's kind of a long quote. A continual looking forward to the eternal world is not, as some modern people think, a form of escapism or wishful thinking, but one of the things a Christian is meant to do. It does not mean that we are to leave the present world as it is. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were those were just those who thought most of the next, the apostles themselves who set on foot the conversion of the Roman Empire, the great men who built up the Middle Ages, the English evangelicals who abolished the slave trade, all left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were occupied with heaven. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so effective in this one. Aim at heaven, and you will get earth thrown in, but aim at earth, and you will get neither. I love it. It says we really do accomplish much here when we think about what's happening or going to happen there, and the fact that we don't think about there, we just become ineffective because we think this is all there is. We have to get it all right now. And, and church, can I remind us, we're not supposed to get it all right now. The reward is future when Jesus is more fully known. I think that screen means we're about done. <laughs> Let me just wrap it out with one last illustration. This won't work for some of you, but it might work for you, for a few of you. In just a few weeks, the Estacada High School football team will begin their summer workouts, and I think they do two a days, morning and evening. Well, back when I played football, because we were a lot tougher back then, we did, <laughs> we did three a days. So really early in the morning, there was a workout. One o'clock, there was a workout, and then about six o'clock, there was a workout. So again, this was in Denver, hot, dry, late August, sweating, drooling, bleeding, running, hitting, hurting. I remember it well to this day. Why go through that? Why go through that? Why 
put ourselves through that anguish. It was a choice. We didn't have to. Well, we did it because of the day that was coming. And in our simple minds back then, that day was Friday night. Home football games with the crowd and the cheerleaders and the band and the glory. That's why we did it. It was that simple. We went through all of that because we were looking forward to the game and the glory and the excitement and the thrill. But again, in our immaturity, the glory was about who? It was about us. But we would still go through all of that because the glory was about us, yet future. So this is not football. This is life. The glory is not our glory. It's the glory of Jesus Christ, yet future. And so that's why we choose to do the things that we do now, to look forward to the glory. And is the glory guaranteed? Maybe you don't know. It is guaranteed. The glory that is manifest in Jesus Christ and then we participate in a full measure is something that is guaranteed for all who trust him now. So that day is something to look forward to. And that day changes the choices we make in this day. May that be the case because the world desperately needs changed people looking for something yet future. Let's pray together. Father God, we just thank you because you're amazing.